We are going to be in the book of Romans. Book of Romans, chapter 1. If you would open your Bibles there. Romans chapter 1. We'll be starting in verses 8 and going to verses 15 this morning. So let's stand and read this section of Scripture before we jump into it. Our message this morning is continued the theme or title of the power of the gospel. I am unashamed. But with this little kind of subheading of the connection to the church. The power of the gospel and the connection to the church. We start here in verses 8 and go through verses 15. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because of your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son, is my witness as to how unnecessary it makes men unnecessary or yeah, unceasingly, not unnecessary, unceasingly. I make mention of you. Always in my prayers make request, if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by others, each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to meet you, and I have been present, prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greek and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Brother Scott, would you uh, open us in prayer, brother? Dear Lord God, we just thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We come before you and ask. Amen. You guys may be seated. So just a quick intro again, since we, we did skip a week. So I know if I skip a week of anything, I'll forget it. This is the book of Romans, an epistle written by Paul. Paul wrote this in the city of Corinth, which was one of his stops in his missionary journeys. He writes about it. Uh, in his other letters, but he was in Corinth for uh, an extra three months, and this is where the epistle of Romans comes from. It was written about 47, 47 AD, give or take, some, some time. This was written to both the Jews and the Greeks that were in Rome. So this book is very unique, but this book is also very deep. It is the foundation, it gives us the foundation for Christian belief, for Christian theology and doctrine. And that's why this book is so important to the church today. And that's why we're going to be going through it verse by verse, piece by piece, line by line. Because if we can get through this book, we will have a strong foundation to build on, to understand the things of God. Let's jump into verse 8 here. He says, first, I thank God. Paul is thankful for the faith of the Roman church because most of them didn't know him personally. He was writing this blindly to the church of Rome, knowing just that he has brothers and sisters in Christ in Rome. So he writes this to them, but he also he wanted to affirm in them that he cared about their welfare. He says to the church of Rome, I didn't forget about you to the church of Rome. I care about you. But he thanks them for their not for their service, but he thanks them for their continued steadfast faithfulness. And we see here. At the end of verse 8, he says, your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Not only 
is he just thankful for them? He's thankful for the testimonies that they have. Thankful for the, the impact that they have had on the world around them. And it says that their faith was known throughout the entire world. Now, do we mean that like their faith was known from, from you know, North America over? No, he's talking about the known world, the civilized world that they knew of, the Roman Empire of the time out and about and around the Mediterranean and up into to Europe a little bit there. I had a map I wanted to use and I forgot to put it in. Man. All right, well, anyway, use your brain's map, eye, okay? So think about this. You know the old saying, all roads lead to Rome, right? Well, after much excavation and mapping, there's this really cool map, and I'm really bummed I don't get to show it to you guys. <laughs> but there's this really cool map, and it shows you the road systems that were in the ancient world, but also the road systems that are being used today. And guess where most of them are heavily concentrated? To Rome. It's really cool. It looks like a vein, it looks like a vein system. So you have like all your little like tiny roads out here, but as you come back and get closer and closer to Rome, you get heavier and heavier traffic, bigger and bigger roads. Most of those roads, and some of the roads that we still use today over in Europe, lead back to Rome. It is amazing to see. But I say that because if all roads lead to Rome, that means roads from Rome, from Rome lead everywhere. Now this is the part of history that we kind of have to understand, and it's... It, you would have to put a lot of pieces together through Paul's letters to get this understanding, but from a historical perspective, we get to see this really cool if you, if you read these articles. There was an, a Roman emperor, his name was Claudius, in 49 AD. Okay, so remember, this is the time Paul's, Paul's writing, Paul's doing his missionary journeys. 49 AD, in Rome, there was this uprising or a supposed uprising that the Romans thought was going on. Well, what was happening was the Jews were conver converting to Christianity, and we now have historical evidence, physical historical evidence, that they had a man who the Roman Empire called Christus, and they were attributing this revolt and revolution to this man. Now, Christus, I don't know about you, sounds a lot like Christ. And that's exactly where we get the word Christ from, is Greek for uh, Christos, or Messiah, or anointed one. So anyway, there's this big revolt going on. They say, well, instead of, you know, sending the army out and kind of like fighting them, we're just going to banish all the Jews. So what happens is, in 49 AD, Claudius says, all the Jews, get out. Now, what he doesn't know is that when he says Jews, he also means Christians. He also means converted Jews. He means Messianic Jews, Jews who believe in the Messiah. So now Claudius, unbeknownst to him, who was trying to squash the rebellion, squash the spread of this new religion, just sent out thousands of missionaries into all the world. Because all roads lead to Rome, all roads from Rome lead to the world. It is amazing to see God's sovereign providential plan worked out even in the things that we would say are terrible. It's like, well, he shouldn't be banishing those people. Right, he probably shouldn't be, but look at the awesome work of God that happens because God was working through this man in established power. Because scriptures say, who appoints the authorities over? He does. We like to think we have some say. 
but ultimately it's the Lord God Almighty who appoints the, the rulers over this world. Why? Because it's his sovereign plan, not ours. Now, Rome was a city about a million people, which in modern times, that's really not a lot of people when you're talking about a city. Because the whole Cecil County isn't even really that. It's a few hundred thousand. But when you go to New York, when you go to L.A., when you go to any other large major metropolitan city, it's millions upon millions upon millions of people. 50,000 estimated, 50,000 of those million people in Rome were Jews. That's 5%. 5% of the total population was Jews. And they said, get out. Now, I don't know about you, but what, what if you were at work and your work was like, uh, we got to cut your pay by 5%. That would sting a little bit, right? So they were kind of having to weigh these options of like, man, are, are we going to be all right? Are we going to do this? What are, we, what are we going to do? Well, he sends the Jews out and banishes them. Another awesome part of this is that Paul gets to meet Priscilla and Aquila. If you remember from Acts, uh, Acts chapter 16, Priscilla and Aquila get to meet up with Paul while he's in Corinth. So not only does he get to hang out with people who or uh, Jews who were in Rome, he's in Corinth now with Priscilla and Aquila who were Roman Jews, now he's writing a letter to the Roman Jews. All things work for good according to those who are called by his purpose. And I'm telling you, the more you read these scriptures, the more you'll understand it, the more it'll make sense, the more you'll be like, whoa, I had no idea. But that first point was Paul was thankful for them. And our question for us today is let us become a church where we are so faithful to the Lord and to his great commission that the world around us will know us by our faith. Because the world around Rome knew of the Roman church, knew of their faith. Why? Because they were sent out because of the steadfastness of their faith. So that's a responsibility of our own is that. We have to be steadfast in our faith and that the community around us will say, man, I know the faith of Conowingo. I know what comes out of Conowingo and it's good things and it's good people and it's and these people are serious about the gospel. Because that's that's what they were serious about. They were serious about getting the gospel out. They, they didn't care about what people thought of them. It was all about when we got when we got banished out of Rome. We're going to go tell people about Jesus. And that's what you see with Priscilla and Aquila when they meet up with Paul in Corinth. The second section here is Paul prayed for them. Verse 9 and 10. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. He says, how unceasingly I make mention of you. They didn't know they had no idea the faithful prayers that Paul was uttering for them. Had no idea. Paul had never been to Rome. But he was praying for that church. He was praying for those believers there. He was praying fervently and faithfully for them. You ever wonder how many people are praying for you? You ever, ever wonder how many unknown prayers are going up for you? How many prayers are we sending up for those around us that they don't know we're praying for them? That's a challenge for us and our prayer life. Go into our secret place. Be together. Commune with the Lord. Pray for those around us. Pray for those that we don't even know. Pray for the churches around us. We see that that was Paul's, Paul's heart in his letters as he opens them. We see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. He's writing to the church of Ephesus. He says, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. He says that about the church of Ephesus. Philippians 1.3, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. He's praying for the church of Philippi. He's praying for the church of Ephesus. 
And James, the, the brother of Jesus, he says, he says this. He says, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And he says, this is the part where I want to kind of like fixate on. He says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Paul consistently prayed for the churches that he had ministered to or had a desire to go and minister to. We can see Paul's heart. It was always for the church as a whole, and he constantly prayed for them. It was never selfish about one church, about one thing, about one program, about one people. It was about all the church, all the churches he had been to, all the believers that he had come in contact with, and the ones he desired to go to. What do our prayer lives look like for other believers and other churches? This isn't a contest. It's not who can do church better. It's not who can get more people in the pews. It's not who can spend the most money. This is a giant task, a big commission given by a big Lord that can only be fulfilled and accomplished if the church is working as one body with many parts to see the world come to know Jesus Christ. Verse 10, he says, that I may succeed in coming to you. Paul has been trying his best to get to Rome, and he just can't do it. He just can't get himself there. But while he's in Corinth, he really makes it clear. He says, my heart is for Jerusalem and for Jerusalem to Rome. He says, I have, I have a plan. I want to get there. He said, but the Lord has prevented me thus far. The Lord has prevented me from getting there. And why is that? Why, why do we think that God prevented Paul from getting to a place that he had such a desire to be? Because he had a lot more work to do where he was. And the only one who knew the work that had to be done was the Lord himself. Now, if we fast forward to chapter 15, verse 30, he says, Now I urge you, brethren, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, I strive together, or to strive together with me in your prayers to God for you. Not only is he saying, hey guys, I want to be there with you, I pray for you, and I want to be there. He says in the closing of his letter, he says, pray for me so that I can get there. Pray for me so I can get there to minister to you. And it's a good thing that he was asking for those prayers because the journey to get there was not going to be an easy one. It was going to be full of suffering. It was going to be full uh, of, of beatings. It was going to be a long journey uh, of a ship ride as a slave, or not, sorry, not, not as a slave, as a, as a prisoner. But also, on his way to Rome, he gets shipwrecked. So his road to Rome was not as easy as he probably thought it was going to be or as easy as it, as it had been to get from one place to the other. But when we honor the call of God that he puts on our hearts, we don't know the journey that it's going to require or the faith that we will need to see it through. But the Lord gives us the Holy Spirit, fills his children, and he surrounds us with believers so that we can go into all the world for the gospel. He doesn't call us to be a lone, lone island ranger. He do, uh, it doesn't call us to be a, Mickey, a lone island or a lone ranger. Thanks. <laughs> now I'm just picturing an island with the lone ranger mask on it. But he doesn't. He doesn't call us to do this alone. He doesn't call us to do this alone. He calls us to do this together. And even if we are alone, he empowers us by his spirit to do his work. But God sends his disciples out two by two. We see that continued on in Paul's missionary journeys two by two. Why? 
because there's a lot of reasons why, but mainly not to do it alone. We are to build each other up. We are to do this together. Hold each other accountable. But to build each other up, because I'll tell you, there are some days where I just don't want to do it. There are some days where I just wake up and the enemy is heavy on me and I just, I don't want to do it. But I'm surrounded by men in this church that pick me up by my bootstraps, give me a little shake, encourage me, and say, press on for the mark. Press on to the end. That's why we don't do it alone. That's why Paul didn't do this alone. Now, what do our prayer requests look like for each other? Do we speak on our needs or do we speak on the desires that the Lord has put on our hearts? Or do we do both? And I say that not as in like there's a right or wrong answer to this. This is just an examination of our own hearts of Paul is asking the church to pray for a desire to be with them on his heart. Have we expressed those interests or desires that we know God has put on our hearts to somebody else to say, man, I really feel like I should be planning a church. Can you play, pray for me for this? Man, I really feel a draw to, to North Dakota. I don't, just... <laughs> I feel a draw to North Dakota. Can you pray with me about that? I desire to go there for some reason. The Lord's drawing me here. The Lord's drawing me there. The Lord wants me to do this or that. Or are we keeping that to ourselves? Kind of like, well, nobody needs to really know about that. That's weird and stupid. No, if it's a desire that God has placed on your heart and on your life, Paul shows us that if it's a desire that lines up with the Lord, that, man, that is something to be prayed for, to see what happens, to see where God leads. Paul prayed for them. And in his prayers, we need to also be seeking God's will in it all, just as he was. Because later on in, in chapter 15 and 16, he says, I will be there if the Lord permits, if the Lord lets me. So that's something we should live by, too. If the Lord lets us, if the Lord permits, if we get there. Our third section here is Paul loved them. Paul loved them. Verses 11 and 12. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gifts to you that you may be established. That is that I may be encouraged that I may be encouraged together with you while among you. Each of us by one other's faith, both yours and mine. He says, I long to see you. To me, that just that just shows Paul's pastor's heart. It shows his heart for the church at Rome that he is invested in their spiritual growth and the salvation that Christ gives to the people at Rome. One indicator in, in his love is his care for Priscilla and Aquila. Like I, we were talking about in Acts 16, they meet up with Paul because they've been exiled. So they become very close with Paul. And this is just, this is just me trying to put two and two together. This isn't anything really different, but this is just me trying to think this through, but Paul, we see earlier before he meets Priscilla and Aquila that he wants to go to Rome, but then he meets Priscilla and Aquila and we get the letter to Rome. So I think the relationship between Priscilla and Aquila and Paul really spurs Paul to say, you know what? I'm doing it. I'm, I'm, writing, I'm writing this letter inspired by the Holy Spirit to be sent out to the church of Rome. He says, I'm going to impart some spiritual gift to you. Now, what does that mean? It sounds like super spiritual, right? Like, I'm going to impart a spiritual gift onto you. It's not that. Paul wanted to just share the gift that God had blessed him with. The gospel of Jesus Christ, his ability to, to preach, his ability to teach, his ability to care, his ability to love, his ability to, all of these things, all these spiritual gifts. 
He just wanted to share that with them. Say, God has done this for me and given me this. I want to give it to you. The cool thing is, we also see that he's partaking in others' faith as well. That he's not just going there to say, listen to me, I'm Paul the Apostle. He comes in with a heart saying, I'm going to give you my gift, and I'm looking to receive your gifts as well. I'm looking to see what God's doing in your life so that I can be edified, I can be built up and encouraged by the church at Rome. That's how we should come into service. That's how we should come into this church saying, I'm not coming in for my show. I'm not coming in to do what I'm going to do. I'm coming in to share what God has blessed me in my life with, and then I'm going to partake in other people's blessings that they've been blessed with so that they can edify and build me up too. It's why we're a body. And we are governed by the head who is Christ. We need to partake in each other's faith, not just our own. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, it says, and let us consider how to, it says, uh, it says stir up one another, how to stir up love and good works. Consider, let us think about how to bring love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see day, the day drawing near. He's saying, gather together, but think about, reason, piece by piece. How are we going to build each other up in, how are we going to spur? Like, when I hear spur, I also think of, like, the spurs that you put on, like, your cowboy boots what's spurring you, you give them a little kick right you give them a little poke to get them moving he says let us consider how to spur one another in love and good works how do we i'm just thinking about like how do we poke each other like, how do we get each other moving how do we get each other closer to the lord how do we do that and he says consider how to Spur each other in good works and love. And then right after that, he says, don't forsake getting together. Because that's a big part of it. Getting together as the church. Spurring us on to good deeds and love. And do not make it a habit to say, I'll go next Sunday. I'll meet next Wednesday. I'll go this time. I don't make it a habit to push it off. But encouraging one another. And he says that the day is drawing near. He's saying the day of the Lord is drawing near. He says, so we don't have time to procrastinate. We don't have time to put it off. But Rusty, this was written 2,000 years ago. Yeah, they still didn't have time to put it off. It's that important. Paul loved the church so much that he wanted to go and encourage them, but he also wanted to be encouraged by them. Have, how are you encouraging others? How are we encouraging others with our spiritual gifts? And how are you being encouraged by others' spiritual gifts? So it's a two-folded question. How are you being encouraged by others, but how are you encouraging others with your gifts? Paul loved them. Paul was indebted to them, verse 13 and 14. I do not want you to be, uh, be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you, I've been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and barbarians, both wise and foolish. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. That's, he, he calls himself that multiple times in scripture but he also says that he has an obligation to the church of Rome these were 
These were Greeks. These were highly educated, uh, the top, tippy top of the top. But we see that Paul says, not only am I obligated to you, I'm obligated to the barbarians. And the Greeks back then, anyone who wasn't a Greek was a barbarian. So you could have been this close to being a Greek, but you weren't a Greek, you're a barbarian. But we see again that he persisted to be there with them and was again hindered by the work of the Lord. And Paul demonstrates a truth that we really need to observe today, and that's even when God has given us a larger vision or task and he's put it on our hearts, we should patiently wait on the obedience of the Lord. But, but Rusty, I have this really big, like, I feel like God is telling me to do this, and I have this really big vision, and it's really awesome, and I think it's going to be, do, like, this is it. I know I'm supposed to be doing this. Are you supposed to be doing it right now? Because Paul desired to be at Rome and was prevented by the Lord not to go to Rome until his permitted time to be at Rome. And spoiler alert, his time at Rome did not end well. <laughs> It's because the Lord had his plan in order, and Paul was being obedient to his plan. Doesn't mean he wasn't, like, ready to go. Doesn't mean that he was just waiting for the opportunity to someone say, hey, Paul, let's go to Rome, and he'd just jump in the wagon with him and ride to Rome. He was obediently and patiently waiting on the Lord, even though Paul was given a greater vision and task that the Lord wanted him to do. Does that mean we sit back and do nothing? No. We continue day by day in obedience, one step at a time, walking in faith each day. Each act of obedience brings us closer and closer to the calling that God has given us. Closer and closer to the goal that God has pressed on your heart. Closer and closer to the place that Lord, the Lord has placed in your life. The direction that the Lord has placed in your life. Obedience gets us closer and closer to the will of God and the destination that he wants you to be at. The Lord would not have given you this desire. The Lord would not have given you this uh, task if he didn't want to see it done. And I say all that to come back to the idea that it all has to be faithful obedience to the Lord in what he has pressed on you and that it matches this book. Because if you feel like God has pressed something on you and it doesn't match this book, it's not from the Lord. That's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. And I'll tell you what, the Lord doesn't sound like your voice in your head. When the Lord speaks to you, you ain't going to hear yourself. When I feel like the Lord has pressed something on me in my life, I'll tell you what, it doesn't sound like Rusty. I'll tell you, it, it does not sound like anybody else. It does not feel like anybody else. It feels like, and most of the time, it's something I don't want to do anyway. Because when the Lord pushes you somewhere and pushes you outside your comfort zone and pushes you into obedience, it's normally somewhere very uncomfortable. So when all of a sudden you're like, man, I feel like I need to do this, but I really don't want to. It's probably the Lord. But on the flip side, if you're like, man, I, I really, really would love to live in Tahiti. Maybe I'll be a missionary in Tahiti. You might want to double check with the Lord on that. I'm not, I'm not so sure that's from him. It might be from your uh, retirement home. <laughs> so Paul is indebted to them. Why? Because he had an obligation from the Lord to his church. We are indebted to the Lord. And we should serve him by sharing his gospel 
until the day we die. I'm trying to remember that old Sunday school song. Uh, he paid a debt I did not owe. I owe the debt I could not pay. The least, the least we could do is serve him. The least we could do is tell people about him. The least we could do is call people to repentance. And on the last, Paul was eager to visit them. Verse 15. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Eager. Eager. He was ready. And this Greek word is only used twice. It's used once when Paul says that he was, uh, he was eager to, to die. And not in the sense of like he was like focused and ready on dying. It's that he was ready. He was ready to die. He was, whatever, Lord, whatever you call me to, I'm ready to. This is, this is a different way this Greek word is used. And it's with focused and intent. He's eager, but he has focus. And he's like excited, but he's focused. He's not like a Jack Russell where he's just like running around and he's just like, I want to go outside, I want to go outside, I want to go outside, I want to go outside. Because they're not very focused. They're just eager to do something. Paul was eager and focused to be with the Church of Rome. Why? Was he ready to sightsee the city? Did he want to go spend some denarii and, you know, go shopping for the weekend? No. Paul was eager to share the gospel and preach to the church. That's what he wanted to do. That was, that's what he was eager about. It was the eager, you saw the eagerness of an evangelist in Paul. He wanted to share the gospel and his spiritual gifts with the church. That's why he was eager to be there. He was eager to share what he has experienced with God with everyone else. The question is, what, is our, what are the driving forces behind our desires? What drives us to continue on? Is it the eagerness of the Lord? Is it, is it the eagerness that God puts in our hearts to say, this is where you're going, this is who you're going to meet, this is what you're going to impart to them? But we can do that every day. Every day. Whether you're stopping and getting a pizza, whether you're vacuuming the floor, whether you're typing an Excel sheet, there are people around you that need what you have to be shared to them, to be edified as believers, but also the gospel of Jesus Christ that you are hiding in your heart that needs to be shared with those around you. Everything we do in obedience and subjection to the Lord can be brought back to one purpose, and that's the gospel. Like I said in the beginning of this study, if we can put a tag or a title on the book of Romans as a theme, it is the gospel. It goes back to the gospel every single time. Paul's desire for his people is to share the gospel. So everything we do in obedience and in, in subjection to the Lord can be brought back to the purpose of the gospel. At this time, I'll call the praise team up for a time of invitation. But I want to conclude with this. Paul's devotion leads him to many different places, to many different people, but his desire to be with the Church of Rome was consistent through that time. Why? Because he was motivated by the love of Jesus Christ to share the good news of the gospel regardless of where he was. Regardless of where you've been and regardless of where you're going, the mission should be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church, our prime object objective is to be motivated by the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing the gospel that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and Jesus is the answer. You remember that old song, Jesus is the answer for the world today? Above him there is no other. Jesus is the way. We cannot compromise. 
we cannot falter. As we honor the veterans, I, I know y'all went through boot camp. You couldn't stop, could you? You had to keep going. You had to dig deep. You had to see the end. You had to know the purpose. That's what God has called us to, to know the purpose, to keep on, to press on to the mark, to finish faithful, to finish strong. Some of us are just starting the race. Some of us are coming to the end. It says, push on, push on, endure, endure, let's go. But our active motivation should be the motivation to see people come to know and follow Jesus Christ in a faithful understanding of who he is. Let's stand and sing our invitation song, and the altar will be open as we sing just as I am. Thank you.